last time uh, when I spoke, uh, we did what I call the uh, Holy Spirit Part 1. And I guess part of the thrust of that was to, to say that it's very important for us to know and understand the Holy Spirit if we are to grow in our understanding of God, and that's been uh, Dermot's overriding theme this year has been where is God and, and the different aspects of how God reveals himself to us. And, um, and so last time what we said was that having a relationship with Jesus means that the Holy Spirit indwells us, yeah. um, which is a, a supernatural thing. How can God's Spirit actually uh, live within our lives? But that's what happens uh, when we have a relationship with Jesus. And the Bible says that he is the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. And that, that same Spirit is dwelling and living in us. And he gives life to our mortal bodies. Now, I want to just recap some of the things that we shared last time in case uh, you weren't here at the time because it was a number of weeks ago. But um, one of the things that we did say was that uh, we asked the question, who is the Holy Spirit? And we said that the Holy Spirit is the third person of uh, what Christians call the Trinity, which is comprised of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we sort of said to our finite minds, that's very difficult to understand because the Bible also says in Deuteronomy 6 and 4 that, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. And so we have these two understandings of who God is that in our minds seem to run on different railway lines. But um, it's all... It all fits together, but it's just difficult for our finite minds to grab it. Both concepts are foundational and true, but they seem to be opposed to us. Um, there are some scriptures that talk a little bit about that. Ephesians 4, 4 to 6 says, For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. And there is one Lord one faith and one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. Matthew twenty-eight nineteen, Jesus speaking says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, the deity of the Holy Spirit, that is the fact that the Holy Spirit is God, is made plain in both Old and New Testaments. We also stated last time clearly that the Holy Spirit um, is a person and he has personality and not a force. So it's not like Star Wars, the force be with you, it's quite different to that. And uh, in this scripture, it, it, um, it actually talks about some of the aspects of the Holy Spirit uh, being God. Um, he is omnipresent, and there's some references there. Omniscient means he's all-knowing, and omnipotent means he's all-powerful, and he possesses an eternal nature. In the Gospels, um, Jesus always speaks of the Holy Spirit as He. And in John 14, 15 to 17, He says, If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. Now, the Bible also makes it clear that as a personality, the Holy Spirit has the components of personality that we would understand. That is, a mind, will and emotions. And uh, 
There's a quote there from Burkhoff who says, philosophers were always operating with the idea of personality as it is realised in man and lost sight of the fact that personality in God might be something infinitely more perfect. As a matter of fact, perfect personality is found only in God. What we see in man is a finite copy of the original. And he said, still more, there's a tri-personality in God of which no analogy is found in human beings. So that's a, a fairly good quote in explaining some of that. Um, we also talked about the fact that the... Uh, yeah, that's what we mentioned before, mind, will and emotions... And we also mentioned uh, that's the emotional side, don't bring sorrow to the Holy Spirit and um, his will. The one and same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. We also talked about the fact that the Holy Spirit is active in creation. And uh, in Genesis it talks about that, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God was hovering above the surface of the waters. And we also mentioned that the Holy Spirit is the active agent when a man or woman comes into relationship with Jesus. How did you and I come into relationship with Jesus? It wasn't through our own... Uh, desire or will, but it was because the Holy Spirit was involved in the process. And uh, there's a, um, there is a quote there, I think I left in, yeah. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. And after dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, he exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say, you must be born again. And last time at the end, I sort of um, left us with a little bit of a challenge, and that challenge was about hunger and thirst. And uh, there was a, a scripture in Matthew that says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I guess I asked us the question, how hungry and thirsty are we um, to know more of God? How hungry and thirsty are you and I to know the Holy Spirit in our lives? Uh, because that's... Uh, quite a critical factor in the whole process of getting to know God um, because there's a relationship between the fact that God desires us to be desiring Him He wants that but, but it's kind of like we've got to actually grow the hunger and grow the thirst so that we ask Him for what He has for us now this morning um, I just want to take us on a little bit further and uh, I want to read out of some scriptures out of Acts this morning. And uh, the book of Acts was written by Luke and uh, Dr. Luke and uh, he also wrote the Gospel of Luke. And if you read those two books one after the other, you recognise that Luke was actually, when he wrote the book of Acts, he was linking it with the first work that he did, which was talking about the things that he saw Jesus doing and saying and Christ's death and resurrection. That was his first book. And then he goes into the second book and very early on, um, in, in uh, chapter 1, verse 3 to 8, he says, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. This is Jesus, of course. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you heard me speak about. 
For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, I think it's, I, I find it significant that the disciples had already been commissioned by Jesus. And uh, you'll remember in Matthew's Gospel, and we read that verse this morning, he says, Go into all the world and preach the Gospel, baptising them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So the commissioning was already done, but before Jesus returned back to heaven, he, he kind of put a little bit of a, um, a stop on the disciples with this and he said look you know before you go on mission you know you have to receive the empowering of the Holy Spirit because what Jesus was trying to get across to them was that without the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives they would have no power to witness no power to live the Christian life and no power to actually serve Jesus in the way that they desired to do and so he didn't really want them to get ahead of themselves. And I think this morning that I want to encourage us to have a similar understanding. I think sometimes in our modern, uh, in our modern uh, Christian faith, we, we tend to sometimes feel, you know, it's a bit optional to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's an optional extra. Um, and, I, and I see that a lot. And, and I, I'm, not just talk, I'm not talking about our church, but I'm just talking generally. I think there's a prevailing attitude that's probably come into the more into the church in the last sort of 15 or 20 years, where people think, yeah, it's an optional extra. It's good that I know Jesus, and it's a kind of a it's a little bit of an optional extra. It's kind of like, do you want fries with your burger? Uh, and uh, of course, you know, the implied answer from the McDonald's employee is, yes, I want fries, but of course everybody says, no, I don't want fries, or I would have already asked for them. Thank you very much. And so you don't. And so there's this kind of thing in, it, in our thinking that says, yeah, it's an optional extra, but Jesus here is saying, no, it's not an optional extra, it's actually imperative. Unless you wait for the gift that the Father had promised, you know, you won't be able to be released properly into mission. Even though you're already commissioned and I've sent you, this is really important. Yeah. And uh, last time we read out of Ephesians 5 and 18 that we were commanded to drink really deep of the Holy Spirit so that we actually receive um, fresh water of God, if I can put it that way, from Him. Mm -hmm. And uh, that verse, of course, says, don't be drunk with wine, but you know, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and the thought in that, in that scripture is filled to overpowering and, and, and the whole theme is built around the idea of drunkenness and we see people who've had too much wine to drink and they stumble around everywhere and so the picture of this is have too much Holy Spirit to drink um, and it will be a good thing um, because what it will do is the supernatural grace and power of God will flood into your life and, and it, it will outwork in all kinds of good ways. So, so what did happen to the disciples and the followers of Jesus consequently? Let's look at Acts chapter 2. And uh, it says this, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And I want to just explain to you this morning, and most people probably realise that, but when it says they were all together in one place, um, it doesn't just mean the 12 or, or the 11 apostles at that stage. Um, but the suggestion is that it actually meant the 120 um, of, of, of the, which was the 11 apostles plus other believers and people who had followed Jesus in that scene. So it was kind of like a congregation. We're not just talking uh, leaders or apostles, we're talking about all of the followers of Jesus and there were probably only about 120 of them at that stage. 
and uh, it says that uh, they were together in one place in the upper room and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting and they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken, which was very strange to them because these men uh, were clearly Jews. And Now, what, what was being spoken? Well, if you, if you look at the, the scripture, there's a couple of verses I didn't read, but it talks about how they were declaring the wonders of God. So when the Holy Spirit um, baptised the believers, they began to declare the wonders of God and they began to speak about all the works of God and the good things that God was doing. And that's what they heard in their own language. Um, however, there were some people there and they mocked them and said, oh, they've had too much wine. So again, there was that analogy, yes, they've been drinking, and uh, because it seemed like perhaps that they were a bit exuberant about the whole process, which was a very, which was a very natural thing to expect. But some thought, well, maybe they've been drinking too much wine. But Peter actually gets up and he ties it all together. And uh, he actually addresses the crowd and he says, he tells them that, that this is actually the fulfilment of a prophecy from the book of Joel in the Old Testament. And this is what Peter says um, in verses 15 and 21. So he says... You're one behind, I think, right? Oh, am I one behind? Yeah. Oh. Blast. Sorry, I missed the other one. Okay, so this is what he says. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In these last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. And the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Sorry, I'm, miss, I'm missing the double click. So what are the key points out of the, out of the prophecy of Joel? Well, firstly, he says, God will pour out his spirit on all people. And I think it's significant when you are dealing with the fact that the Christian faith started with a Jewish Jesus that the prophet Joel says God's going to actually pour his spirit out on all people. So firstly, in terms of God pouring out his spirit on us, there's no racial divide here. Yeah. It's not for one group of people, the Jews, and not for every other nation, but it's, it says all people. The second thing is that he says, your sons and daughters will prophesy. And I think that that's powerful, particularly in terms of where we are at in the 21st century, where there's no gender divide. So in other words, it's not just the blokes, it's men and women, your sons and your daughters. And another one that I think is good, it says... Young men will see visions, but old men will dream dreams. So there's also no ageism in the Holy Spirit. So that there's not an age divide, not a gender divide, not a racial divide. Yeah. But he says, I'll pour out my spirit on my servants, both men and women, and they will prophesy. So God's promise of the Holy Spirit is for you today, even as it is for me today. I can't sort of look at what God 
at what God is doing with the Holy Spirit and say, I'm excluded today. I want to say that each and every one of you are excluded. It doesn't matter if you're old or young, male or female, and it doesn't matter what racial or national background you come from. What nation you come from doesn't matter. Now, in the Old Testament, um, the prophet uh, Zechariah had an encounter with an angel. And uh, in the encounter, he had a dream or a vision. And what he saw was a solid gold lampstand with seven lamps. And there were two olive trees, one on each side of the lampstand. So that's a, an interesting vision. And not surprisingly, um, he asked the angel what it was all about. What does this mean? And this is what the angel replied to him in Zechariah 4 and 6. And he said this. So he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Now, for context, um, in case you don't know who Zerubbabel is, and you may not, Zerubbabel was the governor of Judah when the exiles returned from Babylon back to the land of, uh, of Judah and Israel. Zerubbabel was the governor, and he was the guy that actually had oversight of the work relaying the foundation for the temple because the Jews were attempting to rebuild the temple as one of the first things that they did uh, when some of them came back into the land. And so this word from the angel that uh, he gave to Zechariah was actually a word of encouragement for him to let him know that God's spirit would be the one who would be in a sense, the, the power behind getting that work completed and finished. Yeah. Zerubbabel, they'd laid the foundations at that stage and they'd done a good job, but the work wasn't finished. And so here Zechariah the prophet gets this word uh, that he receives this interpretation from the angel. What's it talking about? Well, what it's saying is Zerubbabel, you'll have to put an effort in and you'll have to do the work, but it's actually not your own effort that's going to achieve the rebuilding of God's temple. It's actually the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the work of the Spirit of God. So when we say not by might nor by power, what are we actually saying? Well, we're saying that, you know, it's not about our own efforts. It's not about our own might or our own power. And uh, in the Psalms, the psalmist, um, there's a couple of Psalms where the psalmist writes about the fact that he doesn't put his trust in chariots and horses, but in the Lord, his God. And that is because when the nations were going to war around about him, for them often it depended on who had the biggest army, who had the most chariots and who had the most horses. And looking at it in a purely natural sense, that army was going to win. But the psalmist said, no, that's not the way I look at it. I don't look at it that way. What I look at is the fact that, you know, it's my trust is in the Lord my God, not in the number of horses or the number of chariots or the number of warriors that I have that are going to the battle. And so there's this clear thing right through Scripture where God uh, begins to... To, to lay this understanding that that really it's all about the work of God supernaturally to shift things in our lives. And, you know, Zerubbabel needed to hear that word of encouragement and I wonder for some of us today whether that's a word that we need to hear in our circumstances. Maybe the sorting out of the situation for your family in your relationships, your employment, your finances, your circumstances, maybe the, re the answer will not come from your own might and power or your own efforts, but maybe the answer is found by my spirit, says the Lord. Mm. Mm. OK, 
Okay, I want to um, I want to stop there this morning because I want to wrap this message and I want to give us time this morning to respond um, to God uh, in the process of uh, the scriptures that we've read and the few thoughts that I've shared this morning. So I'm going to invite um, the musicians to uh, give the team if they wouldn't mind to come back and. Um, You know, when I look back at my life, um, I became a Christian at a young age. And uh, in the church that I was in, um, we put uh, great store and great confidence, rightly, in the Word of God. And uh, I used, I started preaching when I was about 16. And uh, I saw, I saw um, people come to know Jesus as a, res, as a response um, after I'd been preaching. So I knew that, you know, that God was moving um, in response to the preaching of the Word of God. But, you know, in my own incomplete understanding, I didn't really have a right understanding of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so God had to actually, in a sense, take me aside and, uh, I was going to say slap me around, but I don't, I don't mean that. Um, he didn't do that. What he did was he took me aside and he actually schooled me and helped me understand that there was a bit more to the ministry of the Holy Spirit than what I'd encountered in that, in that particular season. And so... Um, what happened was um, God poured His Spirit out on me and I received what I would describe as being a baptism of the Holy Spirit, very much like what occurred uh, with the 120 that we read about this morning. And that actually revolutionised my life uh, because it brought me into a knowledge of, of God in my life that I previously hadn't had, I'd always had a good relationship with God and I, and I understood the truth of God's salvation and, 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 and the gospel and everything with it, but I had an incomplete understanding of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I want to just wrap this message this morning by saying, look, we spoke last time about being hungry and thirsty for more of God. And this morning we've talked about, you know, it's not an optional thing to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But, you know, in Ephesians 5 and 18, it comes across as a command. Paul says, but be filled, you know, but don't be, you know, don't be filled, you know, drink too much wine and be filled with that Spirit, but be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And I want to encourage us, I don't know what your attitude and heart um, is about the Holy Spirit and about being filled with the Holy Spirit this morning. But I want to encourage each of us today. We're, we're going to sing a song in a little while. And then um, right where we are, where we're standing, um, I want to pray. I want to pray for us all this morning. And, and I want to pray for us to receive the ministry of of the Holy Spirit in a deeper way in our lives and that might be first time for you or it might be the umpteenth time that you've received the filling of the Holy Spirit but I want to ask the Spirit of God just to come this morning and uh, and so that we're just going to enter into a space where you know and I want us just to as we sing as uh, the team leads us in, in singing a song to just open our hearts this morning and then I'm going to come back and and uh, I'm going to give us the opportunity just to, to signify that we want to be part of that. And uh, then I'm going to pray. And uh, then soon after that, um, I'll release us for coffee. But I want, um, yeah, I just want to give each of us an opportunity to respond uh, this morning to to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And uh, you know. It's not by mind nor by power, but it is by my spirit, says the Lord.